My name's Michael, and this is All Departments. Here come the cherries, and we're heading for the top of the tree. Bournemouth is a team that's going to show Division 3. Here come the leaders and the scorers at the full Saturday. Showing how to win the Southern way. So we say, come on, Bournemouth. Come on, Bournemouth. While you're out there winning, hear the shouting and the singing. We sing, come on, Bournemouth. Come on, Bournemouth. Here come the cherries. Here come the cherries. Hello and welcome to All Departments. Pre-season training is upon us and once again the players will be returning to Kings Park after a well-earned sunshine break. Maxim Demin would need to build a new pavilion with as many seats as the one in Westover Road to accommodate all the players we've been linked with this summer. But as many have pointed out, tabloid transfer tittle-tattle is much more desirable than talk of points deductions, CVAs and liquidation. Joining us now is a man who's overcome his own share of setbacks in his career to lead our wonderful cherries to unimaginable glory in recent years, Bournemouth's greatest ever captain, Tommy Elphick. Tommy, welcome back. Thanks for having me again. Now, we spoke last summer, and years gone by seems very quickly, looking at it from, from this side of things. Obviously, a lot's happened. Um, I know you've had a bit of a holiday and, and been doing one or two other things, but how has it compared uh, from from last summer? Because, obviously, you've got a lot more attention now that are in the Premier League, even though we haven't kicked off yet. Yeah, I think um, sort of the story... Um, that we've all created together and um, the magnitude of what we've done has it, really been um, taken on. Everybody's really uh, took, took a shine to it and wanted a piece of everyone, not just myself. I've been lucky enough to go and do some uh, sort of TV stuff on, on Sky Sports um, and Premier League TV and a few other interviews and that. But everyone really, they're, they're all getting their own little stories out there and I think that's the beauty about what we've done is there are so many stories and we've all come from um, tough careers if you like, haven't done it the easy way and, and the whole sort of football nation has, has really took a shine to it and, and wanted to know as much as possible about it so it has been pretty full on um, especially for the first couple of weeks you know people wanting you to do various things and, and you have to turn quite a, quite a bit down as well otherwise it can get too much um, the important thing for us you know is, is we want to move forward and and try and establish ourselves in, in the Premier League. So we need to sort of get over this fairy tale story that we've all created, which has been amazing, really. But, but now it's time to get back to business and and really put our stamp on the Premier League if, if we can. And your profile, along with the other players, as you were saying, has has raised quite a bit and probably will do yeah. more so now in the next in the next season. Um, do you do you feel? Um, that you're more public property than you were before? Do you get more attention in the street? You've had people coming up to you when you've been on holiday, anything like that? Yeah, um, I think quite a lot um, of people have taken notes of the championship race this year because it was so tight and, and a lot of people have sort of um, tuned in this season. So we have been noticed quite a bit um, when we've been together more so. Um, and then the odd person, you know, when you're on your own and, and away on holiday and stuff, Um at the airports, you know, people sort of make little remarks like congratulations on last season and, and that's all good. Um, and, and for now, you know, it's, it's great. It's all positive. Um, but it's a, there's a little lesson to be learned in there that, you know, we're playing on the biggest stage now um, and things aren't always going to be smooth. So some of the recognition that we are going to get next season might not be in, in such good light. Um, you know, all the coverage from the press has been amazing. Uh, the TV, the newspapers, it's, it's been nothing but positive. 
but that can quickly change. Um, so we have to realise that, that that could be the situation next season. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's important that we enjoy what we've done and, and um, take great pride in it and, and look back on it with great memories. But, you know, we've got to draw a line under that now and, and look forward and, 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 as I said, really try and establish ourselves in, in the next league up. And has anything surprised you in terms of what's happened since we've been promoted or was it pretty much as you expected um, no I think you, you always have a, have a vision as a player you know you always sort of see an outcome and, and that's a great thing to look forward to and aim for and I always felt that we could, could do it um, you know the, the longer it was going on and the longer we was up at the top it was getting more and more realistic and you know you, it was almost within touching distance with, with a few weeks to go and and then when you finally do it, it's 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 amazing feeling, and you don't really get time to reflect on it because, you know, it's on to the next one now. Um, and the magnitude of what we've done can never be lost. I mean, what we what we've all done as a football club, and and everyone, I include the supporters, um, the, the chairman, and especially the manager and, and the players. You know, what we've done is truly amazing, and it's not something that will fully sink in until we've probably retired and, and look back on our, our careers and think, you know, blimey, we, we put Bournemouth, really did put Bournemouth on the map there. Um, in terms of anything surprising me, I just think how big the Premier League is, obviously, when you're playing and you're a player in the Championship, you're, you're concentrating on your own game and your own team and, and, and trying to be the best you can. And, you know, now we've made that jump. You know, the, the demands of, of what the Premier League requires not even on a playing side yet because we're not even back training yet but you know for the infrastructure and, and what we need to get in place it's, it's really is a crazy world and just going back to last season there was a couple of things I wanted to ask you about we had a lot of brilliant times and, and great results last season there's obviously a few that stick out at the 8-0 at Birmingham for example yeah. but um, looking across the season for me and obviously I'm looking at this from the stands I'm not yeah. Uh, in on the inside, as it were. But the most important result, from my point of view, was when we beat Wolves 2-1 at home, which yeah. was the the game that ended a bit of a bad run of results prior to that. I mean, the performances yeah. were all right, but we weren't really, you know, we all seemed to have a bad time in yeah. February. And I remember that game, um, I think we went 2-1 up quite early in the second half. I think Jan got, mm. uh, scored a penalty. And then after that, I noticed that our style of play which has obviously been uh, lauded quite rightly for you know how stylish we are the way we pass the ball the goals we score the attacking play and all that kind of thing but I noticed and I don't know if this was deliberate or maybe it was just um, psychological that we were much more <laughs> kind of making sure in that game that we got across the line we put we kind of stopped the rot as it were from the previous results and and, and with we, you know there was a lot more kind of booting the ball out of defense that's not really associated mm -hmm. with us is that true or was that was that just something that, that I picked up on because I was so worried about us losing again or drawing again yeah I mean I don't know whether it was by luck or design um, but I remember the game you talked about and I don't know at, at no stage this season did we ever doubt the way we should be playing or the way we were playing um, I remember even quite early on in the season we, we was top for a little bit and then we dropped down to 15th but nothing really changed um, and we pride ourselves on on how we play and, and how we pass the ball but one thing we are great at and we know as a, as a, as a whole team and, and this stems from the manager is, is there are times where you do have to mix it up um, teams were, were coming down towards the end of the season and, and making it really difficult for us and, and we was putting more and more emphasis on our set plays not only attacking them but defending them as well and trying to keep more clean sheets and, and be ruthless in, in both boxes um, so uh, there was a stage last season where people maybe thought we was a little bit of a, a one trick pony and you know was, was sort of saying if, if you could stop Bournemouth playing out then, then you're going to stop and win him but I think as you say with, with games like that we, we really did put a nail in that coffin and, and you look back even the, the Wolves away game uh, was pretty similar um, Bolton away uh, there, there, there was a few last year Middlesbrough away 0-0 um, I think that was the one real big improvement from, from the, the season before we, we kept a hell of a lot of clean sheets last year and and that got lost a little bit with, with all the attacking play and the goals that we created. And, and 
we're all for that. You know, the defenders like to slip under the radar and and you know give all the praise to the boys going forward. But that can't be lost to how we did improve defensively last year. And I just wanted to talk about the running. We had mm. the international break, I think, around March time. And then I think that was when we brought Kenwin Jones in and there were seven yeah. games to go. Uh, and then Kenwin scored, I think, in his first appearance, wasn't it, against Ipswich, he came on Ipswich, and yeah. got us the equaliser. And then there was a few games after that where the play looked more... And I think this probably is something that feeds off the, what's happening on the pitch and in the stands. Everything felt a yeah. bit more. Everything felt a bit more nervy. We had the game at Brighton where mm. went a long time uh, without scoring, and then we managed to get the two goals in probably the final quarter of the game and uh, mm. and got the points. Uh, we had the one at home against Birmingham mm. where we went two 0 down, and I think we certainly went. I think we went in at half time two two. That was another nervy yeah. one. The one that really sticks out for me was um, the one at Reading when we scored mm. early and, and then it felt, I mean, we, when you look at the statistics afterwards, you know, we were basically in charge of the game, but watching from, you know, where I was in the stands, yeah. it was, I, was, I had no fingernails left after that game. Did the players feel that kind of edginess as you got nearer to the line or is that just something that comes from the fans? Um, I, I'm not sure. It's, I can speak for myself. <laughs> There was never one stage towards that running where I, I was in doubt of, about what we was going to go on to do. And, and even if it wasn't to be automatic, I, I still felt that we had more than enough to go and do it through the playoffs. Whether that run through other players where, where they got a little bit nervy, possibly, um, and, and that would be something that you know you could only get from them, and, and no player would, would probably want to admit that. <laughs> but I mean, looking back on hindsight, you, you probably say there were a little bit of nerves flowing around the whole stadium, you know, that everyone, it, 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 the players, the fans, and I mean, the Birmingham game was, was a great example. Um, sometimes as a player, you can get lost in, in all the, um, the plotting up of points, if you like, where people say, oh, that's, that's an easy three points, or that's going to be a tough one, and and, and that one's going to be a tricky one. And, and so, like most of the time, it doesn't work out the way that it should or people would expect. Um, but at that stage of the season, you know, you've come so far and you, you do all your hard work up until Christmas and put your points on the board there. You know, with that last seven or eight games, if, if you're still there, it's, it's just about getting the results. Um, and, and the games that you mentioned, like the Red in away and, and the Brighton away, they give the players no more satisfaction because you know you're not quite at your best, but you're still winning and you still feel like you've you've got five or ten pounds in hand. Do you know what I mean? It, mm. It's a great feeling. Um, and, and all the while we was getting the results and, and even the Birmingham one where we had come back and won, there was great lessons to be had and, and they was only giving us more and more confidence. And then I think, you know, the last three or four games, that's when we sort of the handbrake come off and it was just full steam ahead and we were never going to give it up at that situation, you know. When the fans, myself included, looked at those fixtures towards the end of the season and compared them to our promotion rivals, tend to think, not that the game's going to be easy, but we have no. a kind run-in. Um, yeah. Paper, but as we all know, we don't play on paper. Um, yeah. And <laughs> all of those teams... The games were tough, uh, not as expected, like you said. You just don't know what's going to happen. And the one that no. that um, probably was the lowest point in an otherwise pretty joyous uh, couple of months was was Sheffield Wednesday when yeah. we we conceded. I think Adam Adam Smith conceded that penalty mm. uh, to um, Huey, who later on was our hero from uh, yeah. his goal at Watford. Um, but yeah, I mean that was uh, very late in the game and and. We played, we played well in that, and we deserved to win. What, what was the um, the feeling in the dressing room after that? Do you remember? Yeah, it was. Uh, there was a lot of frustration because it was a funny one because we 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 were I think maybe even one nil down, and we've gone two one in front. Yeah, you know, this massive sense of elation on the pitch, and you can almost feel everybody getting excited, and you're so close, and go on, if we can do this one, we can get promoted next game at home, and. And then to to take a sucker punch like we did, it, it really did feel like a kick in the teeth. And I do remember being in the dressing room, you know, 
Smudger was gutted um, and, and couldn't, you know, he, he was proper upset and, and couldn't apologise enough. And you, you, but it was good to see because he, he, you knew it meant something to him. Um, Harry Arter was frustrated. Frana was frustrated. He had just been sent off. And, and that's where you call on your leaders and, and the senior pros like myself and, and none more so than the manager. Um, and I remember he took a few minutes and didn't come in for a while and he'd obviously just sat and thought about things. And when he come back in, it was all about the bigger picture and how far we'd come and, and look where we actually are. This isn't a bad thing. And now looking back, it was probably the best thing that happened to us because we were playing on the Monday the next game. Um, everyone else done us favours at the weekend and we had a chance to get promoted in front of our home fans and Sky, which we were never going to let that go. So, you know, that's um, then, then setbacks path the way for the comebacks. It's, it's true. And, and in many senses, you look back now and think sometimes it, it was fate and it was meant to be. And, and the way the whole season worked out, it was just fantastic. And, and I wouldn't have changed the moment for, for, for anything, you know. So then, then times, although they're really hard and frustrating, that's, as I said, where the gaffer comes into play. And we was just proper bang on it we had nine days of training coming up and um, we, it was a massive chance for us to get back to our core beliefs and, and uh, I really do feel we're a better team after we've got a full week's training under our belt and you know the way we come out against Bolton I think everybody would agree that that was one of the best performances of the season at a time where we needed it most so no, um, it, it was just the way it all worked out was just fantastic. So Smudger was the one who, who was aggrieved that day, but it, it all come back. And, and for him as well, he had a chance to, to play the next game, and it, it just worked out wonderful, really. Yeah, I think those nine days were a godsend at the time because mm. prior to that, it had been subsequently to the international break, as usual in the lower leagues, the Championship, Leagues One, League Two. Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, there, there was no let up. And then we had that break no. and ours was extended because of yeah. a couple of extra days. Uh, and then, yeah, you mentioned that <laughs> that weekend when we weren't playing, uh, results mm. couldn't have fell much better for us. Rotherham mm. scored late against uh, Norwich to, to limit them to a point. And then Fulham <laughs> had a ding-dong game with um, with Middlesbrough and uh, the borough manager, Karankri, he sent... Konstantopoulos mm. up for the corner and then this was right at the end of the game wasn't it and, and it didn't work yeah. and they broke and Ross McCormack who um, well, they paid a lot of money for Fulham and it almost feels yeah. like some of that money went to our benefit in the end because he yeah. scored right at the death and, and they won 4-3 and then suddenly like you said it was all back in our hands which was mm. not something I certainly expected when we kicked off or when those games kicked off on the Saturday afternoon can you remember what you were doing when you heard those results? Yeah, um, the, what you alluded to, the nine days, it was it was nice because it, and the, the immediate reaction was right, let's, let's have a couple of days off, get away from each other and, and chill out. So lads sort of went home and, and come back and everyone was refreshed. And again, it's, it, it sums the championship up really. You know, you talk about the running earlier and plotting things up and, there is no easy game in in that league and, and you cannot take things for granted. So there's always a hope in the back of your mind. But we had the Saturday off of training because we sometimes have two days off before the game. We, we have a day off. Um, so we had the day off. So it, it was a tricky one. It, a few of the lads saying, well, what are you going to do? Are you, you going to watch the results come in? Are you are you going to... What, what, some, some players went to a game. I think um, Harry Arter might have even gone to Fulham to mm-hmm. watch Fulham Middlesbrough. Um, but for me, I, I, I sort of made a decision before to, to not get involved in any of it because I remember, uh, I think it was the week before Norwich and Middlesbrough played on TV and it was a Friday night, um, obviously the night before the Saturday and, and naturally you'd watch the game on a Friday anyway. So I've, I've sat down and watched it and I just remember really getting emotionally involved in the game and kicking every ball and heading every ball. So I thought this weekend... like forget it just just get out so me and the missus went for for a lunch in the new forest phones were off and, and that was it and I got back with about 10 minutes to go and I thought I can't really act this anymore I've got to have a look so I've had a look and all the results are sort of falling our way and I've turned my phone back on and I have to text in each other and it's it's all going mental um, but again with the way that turned out I think 
Fulham were in front and then Middlesbrough pegged them back and then Fulham went on to win the game. It was crazy. Um, and then we come in on the Sunday and I just remember the boys were at it like you wouldn't believe. Like I've never seen a spring in their step like like it before and, and the training session and everything. It just seemed like, right, that's it. All this, too much has happened now. We, we've, we've sort of not got away with it but we've got a, a lucky with a few results in recent weeks. This guy grabbed the ball by the horn and and there was no doubt in my mind I would have had any money on us winning on that Monday night because I was just so confident after the after the Sunday training session. I think, yeah, like you say, after those results came in, it seemed like almost fate was shining upon mm. us at that point. It didn't really feel that there was any way that we weren't going to do it. And we had everything going for us at that point. And, and, yeah. and so it worked out. And the game against Bolton was... You know, brilliant performance and and obviously the right result and 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 there we were, we were promoted. Um, at the whistle at that game, <laughs> you were um you were in a, a situation which I think all schoolboys fantasise about at some yeah. point. You were you were chaired shoulder high um yeah. off the pitch uh and 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 your dreams had come true. That that must have been one of the highlights of the season for you. Well, yeah, listen, that that's the highlight of my career, but a, a long, long way, and to do it. Um, for this club with the story that we've all created and to do it with, with the boys in the changing room um, and for the manager and, and the chairman and so many people it was just that's why you work hard at your game that's why you give up so much time and, and that's why you give up so much stuff for, for football for, for moments like that um, and, and as I said before a lot of us have come up the hard way and we've got such a bond in the changing room to share that night and, and that pitch with them players is, is something that you know, I will never forget. Um, like I was obviously everybody knows I was out injured for so long, and you know that seemed an absolute million miles away for me getting to this situation. But as I say, that's why we all work hard, and that's all well, that's why we all play football for, for moments like that. And yeah, I mean, highlight of the season by far, yeah, for sure. And there was that picture of you on the back of the Telegraph, and it was basically yeah. the whole. Of the page, yeah. I think you might have that as, as your uh, your Twitter pick now. Um, yeah. How many copies of that did you buy? I haven't got any yet, but I'm, really? I'm going to get some. Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to find where to get them from. Um, but if if someone knows where I can get it, I definitely want to blow that up and get it up, sort of centerpiece of the house because it's an amazing <laughs> picture and the, the actual the whole front page of it. You know, to, to see the newspaper that it was on. Um, like Mourinho in one corner, I think Harry Kane might have been in the other. And as I say, them them moments and and them sort of pictures are something that when you look back on your career and, and realise, gee, we we done that. That was us. That was me there that day playing that game. I don't think it will really sink in what we've done and and how far we've cut until we've retired. We then went into the the final weekend, and it was it was brilliant having another game. Because yeah. at that game on the Monday night, I went, like most people, back to work the next day and, and had this yeah. real contrast between, mm. you know, I've supported Bournemouth since, since 1982 and obviously this had never happened before. So on this real mm. like, high in a, a state of, of total disbelief, really, uh, like very emotional, uh, as you well know. And then the next day, just back to this sort of humdrum, going into work, and, and everything was just was just completely normal again. It was it, was, it didn't mm. to sort of. I felt like I should have had at least another day off to celebrate. But yeah. luckily, we had the game the following weekend, and that was a bank holiday weekend, so most people had a few days off anyway. Uh, we went into that game, and I remember thinking, uh, probably before the game. This is great. We've got we've got a chance to celebrate. We should win the game. You never know. And, yep. and so, what can go wrong? I didn't expect us to win the title. Uh, probably, if I was going to bet on it, <laughs> yeah. Um, we we put another excellent performance. Uh, we won three 0 The third goal, Matt Ritchie scored uh, the third goal, and I remember Andrew Sermon running into the goal <laughs> to get the ball yeah. to see if we could get a few more goals to I think up to a yeah. hundred or something, and. Um, and then it, the celebration had just died down from that goal when I found myself in the middle of something which I'd only previously seen on the television when the crowd around you start cheering about yeah. something that's obviously not connected to what you're seeing on the pitch. And as we know now, that was when Adi Nahui, uh scored for, for Sheffield Wednesday. 
and everyone's like checking their phones and you could see on the pitch I'm a Matt Ritchie punching the air in the middle of the game did you become aware that something had happened from the reaction of the crowd or did some one of your teammates tell you no I think I saw the dugout going mad um <laughs> There was a little break in play just before where someone went down injured, so there was going to be like a mountain of um, added time. Mm. So it's just we were in sort of really enjoying the game, and, and it was and the pressure was off. We was three 0 up, been promoted, and, and things were great. Um, but as I say, that the mindset of the group to go from that massive high, as you said, and then to go again, it, that that does take quite a lot because players can take their eye off the ball a little bit but for us we knew we still had a chance at that title and we were desperate to get it um, because from the previous years where we had been promoted from uh, League 1 we didn't have that title and it does make a little bit of difference for sure it does um, and, and we, we wanted to go in even if it was just to have a good send off for the season that, that's what we wanted to do um, so as I said we was in sort of that mode where yeah, we've done it you know it's, brilliant we've had a great year let's just enjoy the last 10 minutes and this break in play come and scores come up on the big scoreboard in the corner and oh, yeah. I could see that they was still winning 1-0 so I was a little I was gutted you know what I mean I thought they might have done us a favour but with us having so much added time obviously they didn't have a lot of time left to play and then one cheer went up and I was like well, what's this all about and it was obviously the goal that Nahiri had scored and then the biggest one was yet to come when the final whistle went. When their final whistle was obviously gone, and then the crowd are going mad and the gaffers going mad and we still had about seven or eight minutes to play. And just remember, like, looking at Cookie and we was just absolutely laughing through each other, like, and we was just so happy. And it means everything to win the title. Like, to, to go on that bus parade with, with the trophy as champions and to to get promoted out of that league as champions that, that is what means everything um, and, and when you look back if you didn't have the chance to say that you were champions after the season that we had had being at the top for so long and being in many people's eyes and, and our eyes we were the best team in the league and we deserved that title um, so again it was like a sort of it was like it was always almost meant to be and it was it was fate um, but it, it as I say, to, to cap it off like that, it was just an, an unbelievable afternoon again after what we'd just been through. So it's just that that week is something that we will never forget. In the last 10 minutes of that game, I did not have a clue what was going on. I was, all, all I was thinking was about the, the trophy and, and people that weren't there and people that were there and you know people that had helped me get to this stage. And it was just a real blur that last 10 minutes. It was crazy. Yeah, people asked me, you know, mates who didn't go, what it was like and obviously yeah. I said it was brilliant and it's quite I mean you were on the pitch so you actually had something to do whereas I was amongst yeah. the fans all I had yeah. to do along with everybody else was spend about half an hour just like cheering yeah. you know my head off and you, you always hear this uh, from sportsmen in particular when they've done something uh, kind of career defining that yeah. they, they get asked what was it like? And you can't really put it into words. And it was the same at that at that point on a, a different yeah. sort of level from a fan's point of view. I, all, all I could really say to people was it was it was absolutely brilliant. And mm. I just, I basically just cheered my head off for half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> really, no, really no, that no, much no. else to say. But it, it's the glory that is yeah. the thing, isn't it? I mean, because yeah. it, there's all that stuff in football about you know the way the game's gone and the money and this, that, and the other. Uh, and the celebrity of the players, which you're going to probably have a little taste of going forward. Mm. Um, the thing that all players say, no matter how famous they get and how much you know international caps they get, that they want to win things. And and, ha and that that trophy. I mean, you're obviously a bit younger than me, but when I was growing up, that was the trophy that was given to the champions of England yeah. throughout the ages. Yeah. You know, Liverpool were always winning it, Everton, and and that was so iconic. And I thought and mentioned on this podcast many times that. I kind of would find myself daydreaming about you <laughs> lifting the trophy, and you probably had let your mind wander to that occasion yourself. So when you did lift it, I, you know, was watching you in particular, and I remember you had your phone in your hand and you tucked it down in your sock. I was thinking, what's he going to do with that? And he lifted yeah. the trophy, and you tucked it down in your sock, and then you went up to get it, and you know, I couldn't probably like yourself actually believe what was happening. But um, yeah. I, I just wanted to ask a, a slightly offbeat question about the trophy. Did you 
take the trophy home because I spoke to Wade Elliott, who used to play for us a couple of weeks ago, right. and he woke up the morning after the playoff final in 2003 mm-hmm. with the trophy on his television. Jeez, right. wow. <laughs> but you didn't get to take yeah. it home. No, I didn't. No, um, was the last time I saw it? I think, obviously, it come back on the bus. I didn't let it go until I got back on the bus and then got back on the bus and everyone was having their photos done with it and... Uh, where did we end up that night? I think we went out in Bournemouth maybe that night as well. But I don't, I don't know where the trophy's gone. I hadn't got a clue. But as, a, as I say, that all that, like when you go up to get the trophy, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I was filming on my phone and I look back at the film that I took and it's absolutely rubbish. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I would love to have got like some decent photos. You see everyone with their phones now in these trophy parades and uh, Smudge have got a great one with all the fans. It really was amazing. Um, but it's like it's, it's so surreal and you're on such a high you haven't got a clue what is going on uh, it's, it's just it's so weird and, and like you said you can't explain it but the, what we've done and, and this, that's, everybody says it now the championship is the hardest division to get out of going upwards um, and you know people you, you know speak to they're like oh you're going to be playing against this one and that one and you know the money what about the money that must be brilliant and that means nothing to me. Like if I, I get more satisfaction out of looking back and to say that I've lifted that trophy and, and won that trophy with this group of players and the way we have, that is the ultimate satisfaction. And if, if I'm ever down one day, if I'll just bring up images of that and, and, and watch as many games from that season as possible. Um, you know, I could have, I could stop playing tomorrow and I would, finished with so much satisfaction out of what we've done last year um, but as I say that again you know hopefully there's more to come from this group because we're all at such a good age and, and going forward and you never know what we could do yeah I think you mentioned earlier about how once the celebrations died down your mind and I think it's human nature turns to the next thing. I mean, I've away, yeah. done a couple of things like run a marathon and one or two things at work, which in no way compare mm-hmm. to the same level as what you guys achieved this season. But you focus on that thing at the time and it's, 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 it is really important to you at the time. And, and yeah. there's a, a, a short period afterwards when you feel really elated about it. But it actually, yeah. it isn't long before you kind of think, well, what do we do next? And of course, for you, yeah. you know what you're going to do next because you're going to be going yeah. back into pre-season soon and, and, and moving on to the next thing. So, I mean, for what you've already said, it's going to be relatively straightforward for the players and obviously the manager's going to have this attitude as well to think, well, you know what, we did brilliant last season, but that's yeah. history now. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I think this team is built on a winning mentality and anybody who shares the same winning mentality as the manager as myself and there's so many players that we've got in that dressing room, they will all know that once you've done that, it's now the next one. And even straight after we've lifted that trophy and, and sat down in the dressing room and, and said our well done and had the awards, you know, we've got a bang. This is what we've got to do to get ready for next season. Um, enjoy it by all means, but you've got to be ready to hit the ground running from day one. And, and even while you're in, like we obviously went away together, even while you're enjoying that, every conversation comes back to, what can we do next? Do you know what I mean? How many goals do you reckon you're going to get next year? What do you reckon, how many games do you want to play? What are you looking forward to playing? And, and that's the next thing. And the last three or four weeks since we've, well, the last two or three weeks really, since we've all been back from the holidays, it's all been about fixture list. And now the fixtures are out. Everybody's got it ingrained. Aston Villa at home. You know, everybody wants to be ready for that game. It's been being ready now and, and for Saturday when we're back in training to, to hit the ground running and being in the best possible condition that you can be in to, to make sure that you're in that side for that game. And we've signed a few new players who will be coming in, I suppose, for the first time this coming weekend. Have you met any of them yet? No, I've not met any of them. Um, obviously, you no know, Josh King from playing against him and, and Federici the same. Um, that two I wouldn't have ever come across. Um, and then obviously to, to get Arta back is, is a big bonus as well. Um, but from what I hear and, and the people that I've met, and you know, they're good lads, they're the right types. Uh, they're all hard workers. And, and you know, it's, that, that transition moving to a new club is something that can't be underestimated when you move to a new place and 
everything becomes that little bit more difficult if you're moving down with a family or, or even just your girlfriend with us. You have to accommodate for everyone. And, and for us, it's all about the, the team ethic and the work ethic and togetherness. So, so the likes of myself and, and the, the Fanos and the Harry Arters, we, we have to get these lads into the group as quickly as possible to give them the best chance possible to perform at their best. Um, which the manager, you know, he'll be looking at that a lot. And, and that's a responsibility of, of mine as, as well as some others. So, um, but again, just looking at them from from the outside, there there are types of players. They're all at good ages, um, and they've all got plenty of improvement in them that the gaffer no, no doubt will get out of them. And you mentioned the fixtures, and there's yeah. a bit of coincidence in that we drew Villa and Liverpool recently yeah. in cup competitions, and then yeah. they've been pulled out on the fixture list in the Premier League. Uh, I mm. think that it could work to our advantage because you mentioned about how we need to forget about last season uh, and look at what's going to happen going forward. And having mm. played those two teams already relatively recently and most of the players in the team would have played against them, it kind of yeah. removes any lingering, starry-eyed looking at, you know, oh, look at us, we're playing Aston Villa, we're playing Liverpool. Yeah. I mean, I don't really think we had that anyway when we were playing. That doesn't seem to be, and I remember I spoke to you about this before last season when we played Liverpool, but yeah, um, yeah it, 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 it almost is a little bit of a bonus drawing those two first because then we're straight into it and it isn't really anything new in a way, is it? No, I think, I think it removes a little bit of doubt in your head about who you might be coming up against. Listen, obviously, uh, both of them squads are going to change from now to the start of the season as probably will ours. Um, and when we played them both last season, we made um, so many changes. So it's going to be two, four games, whatever you want to say. It's going to be completely different games. Um, four completely different teams, if you like. Uh, three teams, sorry. So, But the, the thing that it does do is, it, I think you, know, you alluded to it there, it brings a little bit of comfort that you know you know, who you might be playing against or where you might be going. Um, and I think being at home is a, is a big bonus as well. Um, but this is where we are now. We've got to get used to playing these big teams and we've got to get used to it sooner rather than later because, as I say, we've done what we've done last year and it's all about survival this year and, and trying to make a mark on the Premier League. And if you're going to have time to, to be starry-eyed and... and be in awe of certain players, then, then you're going to get punished. So we need to get that out of our heads as, as quick as possible. Um, and hopefully playing two teams that we played last season might help do that quickly. And there's just a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about before we finish up. The first thing is um, your routines before the game, mm. the goalpost routine, has had plenty of coverage in the mm. past year. And you've also talked about your other superstitions. I don't really want to go through that again. I don't know if you get tired of talking about it or not. But there was something I wanted to ask you about. Um, because yeah. um, it, And it's, it's what goes on, and you may not be able to reveal all of this, in the huddle yeah. before the game. The players huddle together in the pitch. And uh, because we were on TV a bit more this year, yeah. the cameras zoom in on that. And so, I, you know, yeah. although it's not possible to see what's being said, you can't even see your mouth, but you're there in the middle and the fingers wagging and, you know, you're doing the captain's bit in there. The thing I wanted to ask you about that was that is it difficult week after week to find the motivating words or is that all just part of what you do as a captain? Yeah, no, I think it's just it's part of me, really. Um, <clears throat> if I weren't doing it there, then I'd be doing it in the dressing room whether I'd be captain or not. Um, and I, I love it. It's, it's, it's something that changes every week. It's a different situation every week. You're playing against different opposition. Um, sometimes I, I will think about it all week going into the game about what I'm going to say. Other times I might just think about it before the game. Um, but it's, it's a delicate period because some players get nervous. Some players just want, want to get on with it. So you've got to strike a, a good balance. Um, you know, in, in the big game, it's, it's, it's all about relaxing certain people and, and in the, the, the not so big game, you might be going away to a team like Rotherham on, on, a, on a cold Tuesday night, for example, or Leeds on a Tuesday night like last season. You know, it's time to get stuck into a few and, and make sure that they're ready. Um, but I'd, I just like to be able to engage people and, and look them in the eye and, and make sure they're ready because... If they're not ready, it's going to implicate on the team and, and me. So it's, it's 
at that time is crucial to, to either relax one or two or get a, get one or two fired up or even if you've got new players coming into the team that, that haven't played in recent weeks, a time to make them feel good about themselves and, and give them confidence. Um, but when you're playing in a good team, it, it's easy and it just rolls. You know, if, if you're losing... Sometimes people can get, well, who is this guy to, to be telling me what to do? And, you know, if you're not going through a good time, it, it, well, who are you to tell me that? So it is a, a balance and a blend of, of what you've got to say and, and something that I don't take lightly because, as I said, it's such a crucial time. And the last thing I want to ask you about, Tom, was your goal last season, um, <laughs> which was the only one last season, I think, for you yeah. against uh, Rotherham. Uh, and it yeah. came in injury time uh, yeah. at the end of the first half uh, at the New York Stadium. I think we won 2 0 in the end. Mm. Um, it was ahead. I think Charlie Daniels had a free kick and he, he played it yeah. in. And you rose. And, and I was delighted. I, was, I wasn't at the game. I was here. And I remember saying to my son, Oh, Tommy scored a goal. It's you know, his yeah. first one this season. I think, I think everyone, else, everyone else had scored by then. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and then I saw it. And it reminded me, it took me back to when you had that that episode with um, with Steve Fletcher when you were at Brighton, that one was televised and, and you know, the hands went up and all that. I think we talked about that yeah. last year. Did you, and I'm, I know what you're going to say to this, you're going to say yes, yeah. did you have the final touch? Yes, I did. <laughs> but but not, not the way that you think. I think I headed it against him and then it come back and hit me and went in. So it was a lot of, lot of luck. But it's something, listen, it, that was some a part of my game that I wasn't happy with last year. Um I should have scored more goals, but like just even looking back quickly, like thinking back now quickly, the, the Middlesbrough game, I don't know how I can score against them. Um, and like over my career, I've sort of averaged two goals a season, like every year, I always scored two. So I know that. That's something for me that, that I spoke about with the gaffer, and, and, and I need to improve because it helps take some. It's, it's another feather in the cap. Um, so that, that, yeah, without getting too serious about it and definitely got to start scoring more goals well Tommy we look forward to seeing you banging them in <laughs> next yeah. season in the Premier yeah. League thanks ever so much for sparing the time yeah. to come on the show and the best luck next season top man thank you Tommy 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 Thanks a million to Tommy. Really appreciate him coming on. It was good to hear a bit more detail of what went on last season from his perspective. Thanks also to everyone who's been in touch about the recent podcast and our cherished tactical strategy. It was a bit more of a demanding listen than usual, but well worth the effort, and I'm pleased to say the response has been overwhelmingly positive. If you haven't heard that one yet, or want to catch up on any of the previous interviews, check out the archive section of the website at www.alldepartments.wordpress.com. If you want to get in touch, email alldepartmentspodcast at gmail.com and you can follow on Twitter at All Departments. I'm currently in the process of changing podcast web hosting platform to Acast. The good people there assure me there'll be no technical glitches as we move things across, but if you do experience any issues downloading, let me know and I'll bring it to their attention. One benefit of this new arrangement is you'll be able to stream the show direct from Acast should you wish to do so, and I'll be tweeting the link for that regularly and will update the waste listen section of the website with the details. Well, as I discussed with Tommy, the rise of AFC Bournemouth has seen exponential growth in all things cherry flavoured in the media. And one area that has seen more activity of late is the trickle of cherry red records that has come to our attention. I think most people would concur that the combination of football and music has produced mixed results over the years. But I still admire the pluck of those who are prepared to release their efforts into the minefield of public opinion. One man who's done that lately is local singer-songwriter Julian Barnes who's also penned a Cherries-based tribute to Gordon the Tramp on his album In Between the Lines. You can check that out on iTunes, but first, here's Julian's AFC Bournemouth song. Start the Cherries in all departments, and goodbye! It's all over, and Bournemouth by two winning ways. Turn to f-